I'm Karen Gold. Welcome back to the farm. This is the Produce with a Purpose Cook Along. I'm really happy to have you with us. I'm here with our producer, Rebecca Riley, who you can't see, but without her, none of this would be really functioning at all. So uh, I want to welcome you. A lot of our friends are popping in um, through different organizations that we've worked with or connected to. So I just want to shout out to all the friends from Wellness Within or Health Education Council, uh, Triumph. Uh, are there any firefighters out there? Feel free to um, let us know. Pop your comments in so we can see how you're doing. Hi, Claire. Good to see you. Um, Claire is my oldest friend in the in the world. So um, wonderful to have her support here. This is super good. Um, but it just reminds us that the comments are available for you to um, ask questions or let us know where you're coming from or say hi to people. All good. So um, we work on the premise that your doctor at some point told you you should eat more produce, right? Uh, and usually that goes along with a nasty uh, diagnosis and you're totally overwhelmed and it just seems not doable and or, or you're taking away all my fun stuff and kicking me when I'm down. So we don't want that. We want this to be um, very easy and delicious, right? Stupid easy, madly tasty, secretly healthy. That's what we're after. So we're going to break it down a little bit today and go after some basics. Um, let's talk a little bit about why, why we're going to bother. Hi, Virginia. Um, we, um, we're going to look a little bit at the how and the why. The why being why, why, why is food medicine? Why do I have to do this? Why is it worth the trouble, right? And how we're going to look at a little bit of knife skills to um, bump up our game because when you feel comfortable with your knife skills, everything, the whole prep thing goes so much faster. And it doesn't make any sense if you're not feeling well, you have health challenges and you got a lot on your mind to have anything but just a super simple, um, you know, prep regimen that you do. So for me, the basics started with um, my dad getting cancer. He had prostate cancer. He outran it for, I don't know, about 25 years and he looked pretty good doing it. Um, his friends, you know, he would talk about it with friends who are going through something similar and they resisted. I mean, they really dug their heels in and they weren't even the ones cooking. So my dad found though that, you know, information was empowering and he really became his own best advocate and, and you know, tried a lot of things. Um, and the thing is that, you know, the information empowers you and the, it, it gives you options. And when you have options, you know, I can try another thing then you always have some hope, right? Because we haven't run out of, of things we can work with. So uh, we're gonna look a little bit at um, why this is, uh, why food is medicine and, and, and why it works for us. So the first thing, let's take a quick look um, at what our basic goals are. I mean, what do we want our food to do? Right? We don't just want to like fill our pie hole and, you know, get a sugar buzz. I mean, that's not really what we're after at this point, right? First of all, we want to be able to resist disease. We want vibrant overall health. Because, yeah, some treatments, they have a lot of trade-offs. We want all of it, all the goodness, right? We can put in here a little bit of cooking like grandma and getting some comfort food. And I'll tell you why cooking like grandma is worthwhile in a minute. And then because, yeah, things like, you know, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, they weigh on you, right? And so we want to compensate with some joy and color and flavor because they lift your mental health as well as your physical health. So, so how exactly do plant foods resist disease, help us resist disease. Um, and, and I should point out the World Health Organization recently published a big article on how many of the world's preventable non-contagious type diseases are largely due to suboptimal diet, meaning 
too much salt, not enough fruit and vegetables, not enough seeds, not enough you know, beans and fiber things. Um, and it, it's a pretty extensive report. I'm not going to you know, go on about it here. But it's a pretty resounding confirmation that you know, your diet is a big deal. A lot of the plant chemicals um, really directly help you resist diseases like cancer. Many are going to stimulate your own disease-fighting abilities. And to be honest, that's where cancer research is going anyway, right? On how to trigger your body to fight back. Because you have the wherewithal, somewhere it's gone wrong. Um, so they, that's where cancer research is right now, but that's where a good diet is already. Uh, complex plant medicines in the whole food can be more accessible to your body and better buffered and sometimes symbiotic, right? They can help each other be more um, effective for you. Excess acidity in our systems and excess weight are both tied to many diseases and to diets that are low on veggies. So when I say excess ac acidity, I don't mean that you're eating lemons. I mean that you're eating foods that cause your body to acidify and stress does that too, right? But but a high fat diet, for example, is going to make your body react by acidifying to compensate. And that's where we want to run into inflammation and that connects to all kinds of awful things. Um, one of the big benefits of actually eating some whole healthy produce, fruit and vegetables, is that when you're eating that, you're not eating something bad. Not something that, you know, you're avoiding something that would do damage. So that day that you sit down with, you know, some, some crudités and hummus instead of pork cracklings, you got two benefits for one. So the CDC, as well as the World Health Organization, say fruit and vegetables add, to, add nutrients to your diet that help protect you from heart disease, stroke, and some cancers. In addition, choosing vegetables, fruits, nuts, and other produce over high-calorie foods can help you manage your weight. See, they agree with me. Aren't they clever? <coughs> so let's talk about vibrant health. I mean, the whole picture. We want you to feel great, look well, and enjoy your life because you've got plenty of energy to do what you need to do, right? First, we want to reduce some pesticides and additives and all that toxic baggage stuff that's in processed foods. Accessing vitamins, minerals, and phytochemicals at their best in their whole food state is super good for us. Fruit and vegetables also help us stay hydrated, which is really, really important, especially when it's without um, the sugar and the additives in um, nasty drinks. You know the ones. I'm not going to mention any names. Um, Keeping hydrated too, and keeping you know a, a good broad spectrum of um, of phytonutrients helps keep your liver, your kidneys, your lungs, and your skin clean. And those are your filters, right? You change your filters in your car, or you change your filters on your air conditioning. If you don't change it on your dryer, you know for your laundry, your house is going to go up in flames. So let's do the same for our body, yeah. When your body feels like it's getting everything it needs, when you eat nutrient-dense food with those nutrients being really nice and accessible, it stops asking you for more stuff, right? So, like, how many people have nibbled after dinner? Yeah, that's not optimal, right? That's your body saying, yeah, I didn't get everything I wanted. So, um, so you know, give it the real stuff. Now, cooking like grandma, I had two grandmas. One grandma lived in an apartment in Scarsdale, and the other one lived on a farm. In fairness, she didn't always live on the farm. She lived um, in Everett, Massachusetts, and she had a little convenience store. And as my dad was growing up, they ate a lot of the staple stuff that was on the shelves of the store when times were a bit tough, right? Um, my dad hated jello. I mean, hated it for the entire rest of his life. But once grandma moved to the farm, everything was a bit different. And I couldn't figure out, like, why is her cooking so good? She doesn't do anything fancier than the other grandma. Why is this so much better? Well, she had her own garden, she had her own chickens and eggs and all that, right? Uh, sometimes they even had dairy cows. 
but she had her own great big garden. She put stuff up and she, you know, she canned and she did all kinds of um, just simple things to have real food available all the time. So in her case, it was, uh, see, like when I say local, it was her backyard. But when we can eat, you know, seasonal and local food, because in her era, things weren't shipped in from the far reaches of the earth because we had to have grapes in the off season in May, right? They just ate what was in season in their area more. Simple and fresh. So here's the, the big shortcut is that fresh food has more flavor. So you have to do less stuff to it to make it pop, right? And be exciting. Grandma had confidence. Not like she was like, you know, going to go on one of those crazy chef shows and knock them all dead. It was just like, this is her terrain in the kitchen, right? These are, these are her tools. These are her, you know, this is her produce. Confidence in making a straightforward, simple meal that she knew how to do. And it was important for the whole family, right? And she was a master of really basic skills. Not foo-foo skills. She wasn't, you know aerosolizing foamy whatever's to put on a plate or anything like that, nothing crazy, just basic skills, right? And of course she had her favorites and go-to recipes, a lot were in her head. She wrote down some of them um, on, you know, the old fashioned recipe cards, sadly in pencil, and I can't read them now, but I wish I could, because her food was comfort food. And a lot of people, if you ask them, you know, what kind of foods do you have good associations with? For some reason, grandmas come into the picture a lot. So joy, color, and flavor. Disease-fighting nutrients come in bright colors. Anthocyanins are attached to the, the dark purple things, right? The orange uh, vegetables have your, your beta-carotene family. The dark greens have zeaxanthins and all kinds of good stuff for you. But on top of that, like I said, it's going to lift your spirits and it'll help your appetite. And we know that between the disease and the treatment, very often your appetite is not great and the stress, of course. But seeing those bright colors like a party on your plate, we're going to find one of your senses that's not upset right now and hope to attract your appetite that way. Fresh food, as I said, contains more flavor because, well, it's had less time to degrade, you know? So it needs less salt, less additives, and everything to just get your attention. You know that summer tomato taste when it's just real right off the vine. Just lights up all of these places in your brain. It's wonderful. And the other thing about joy and color and flavor is that if food doesn't make you happy, you can have all the willpower in the world. Let's be honest. You're going to do it once, take it for the team, and say, there, I've done kale. I'm out. That's it. You know, you won't eat it no matter how healthy it is. When I lived in Mexico, the government uh, supplied the local clinic with children's vitamins, and they would give it to the moms, and the moms would go home and have a terrible wrestling match with the kids. Uh, and usually the mom lost, and the vitamins would end up spit out on the floor. Well, none of the vitamins can help you if they won't go in your body, right? And if it doesn't taste good, it won't go in your body. So fruity tasting, you know, Flintstones and whatever other vitamins ended up working for those kids really well just because they actually went in the kids. Now, I'm not saying you guys are kids or that you're having tantrums and spitting stuff out on the floor. But honestly, if it was just all up to willpower, I don't know. Mine's not that great. I don't know about you. So here's the real question. If I'm going to make the effort to get that really fresh stuff, is it worth it? Well, back in the 80s, the big cancer organizations swore that there was just no connection at all between cancer and diet. Nowadays, mainstream medicine is kind of finally catching up and seeing that plant-based or a Mediterranean diet can really provide effective and affordable improvement to your wellness, boost your immune system, even reduce the amount of medication a patient has to take. Now, I'll tell you, 
Uh, I do not prescribe because I'm not that kind of doctor, obviously, but uh, a lovely lady who came to one of my classes said she felt uncomfortable taking so many different blood pressure medications. And I said, well, try this. Try eating four stalks of celery a day. There's no possible side effect. You know, you get plenty of fiber. Um, there's no downside to it, right? But if you can do that, see if that will give you a good effect on your blood pressure. Next time she went to the doctor, her numbers were so nice, he took her off one of her pills and she came back to class very, very happy. That made me very, very happy. But, you know, that's a, that's a powerful testimony, right? Just eating some celery was as good as a pill. And if you can do with even one less pill, I'm all for it. So I will never make exaggerated promises to you. I always want you to think for yourself, critically think about hype. You know, more, more stuff comes out like, do this, oh, here, can't, oh, oh, oh. and they go on and on with all the exclamation points, and that should immediately raise your eyebrows. But um, I will not tell you that a, eating a pound of broccoli every day is going to cure cancer, um, but some folks have had really amazing results, and it's totally up to you how much you want to commit, right? Um, if you want to go all in, like, uh, in crispy cancer you may have seen that website where he really committed entirely to having a super super clean diet um, you may want to make it you know a really core piece of your treatment or you want to make it complementary with what you're doing with your doctor or you may just want to enhance your diet a bit try to give yourself a bit more more energy but in general when I say you know eating more plant-based foods Think of it like your local firehouse. You want your local firehouse to have the best trained people with the best equipment, right? All the wherewithal, all the skills, just really everything you can get into a firehouse. It doesn't mean nothing will ever catch on fire. And it doesn't mean that every fire, you know, will be put out before any damage can be done. But you still want to have all the best stuff for firefighting. That's your body. Give, you the, give yourself the best stuff. So there are really clear straight lines between eating more produce and reducing obesity and the heart disease that can go with it, of course, and diabetes. I mean, really straight lines. But folks are also finding, whether in a laboratory or in uh, their own empirical experience, the diet effects arthritis, dementia, fibromyalgia, high blood pressure, liver and kidney disease, depression, and more, including cancer, some cancers more than others, particularly colorectal cancers are huge. The big key item is the phytonutrients. They are plant chemicals that have specific gifts that support our wellness, they have specific actions for us. It's not folk medicine, it's not old wives' tales, although those folks and those old wives were using empirical observation to assess whether these things were worth continuing to do, of course, right? But don't worry about knowing all the phytochemicals or getting every single one in and you know, huge amounts. Just eat lots of deeply colored, very fresh veggies and you'll be getting plenty of all that. So that's the why, right? Mostly the answer is phytonutrients. That's why we want to get much more plant food into our system. So I want to talk about some basic knife skills because this is the key to how, right? It's, I want your knife to end up being like just your, your right hand's right hand man or left if you're left-handed. You only need three basic knives. I want you to get one knife that's great that feels really comfortable for you that keeps a keeps a sharp edge and you gotta sharpen it once in a while and then i just want you to know a couple of hand positions for chopping and some common sense safety and i think that'll give you the confidence to just go at prepping vegetables with a you know a little ease of mind there so if we can look at these three we have a chef knife, 
a serrated edge, and a paring knife. The serrated edge, uh, if you think it, of it like uh, in terms of a bread knife, it's for things where the outside is tougher than the inside, right? Because if you're just trying to, you know, chop on a piece of bread with a dull knife and everything, you're just going to have a smushed wad of dough, right, down at the, <laughs> at the end of it. So um, it's really for getting a little, you know, purchase into that harder outside. And the paring knife, of course, is for getting things like potato eyes and things out of the way. Your, your chef's knife, you want a good big chef knife. Um, and, and you'll end up using it pretty much for everyone. So let's give ourselves a little bitty quiz here. Which knife do you think works on celery? Our chopping knife, right? What about the tomato? Well, unless they're those rock hard ones we get in the winter, um, a nice tomato would really be sliced better with a serrated edge. How about a carrot? Yeah, we're gonna chop that one with the big old, the big old chef knife. Onion, likewise. Strawberries, yeah, we're gonna use the paring knife for that little hull, you know, to get that little green bit out or white bit if it's not a super ripe one. Um, peaches, yeah, if we're gonna peel, or if we're gonna cut out little bits of little things here and there, bruises. What about lettuce? What do you think about lettuce? Actually, it's a trick question. You should tear lettuce. Sorry, trick question. Um, the reason is that the, the latex in lettuce interacts with the iron in your stainless steel and um, it very quickly oxidizes the edges. And so if you're prepping your salad ahead of time, by the time you get back to it later, the edges of your lettuce are gonna be brown and possibly even a little bit bitter, and nobody likes nobody likes that. So just tear it up, or if you have a ceramic or a plastic knife, you can use those. For balance and durability, a really good knife should have um, what they call a full tang. The tang is this part here, right? Here's the blade, here's the tang. What you don't want is one of those rickety plastic handles where the tang goes in about this far, and that's gonna break eventually, and it could break in a dangerous way, so you really do not want that to happen. And you want some nice rivets that are gonna hold this together, no crazy glue, right? Not like just molded plastic and stick the metal in there. Just get a nice full tang, riveted in place. The other reason for this is that the weight is better balanced, right? So you're gonna hold it like this and like this. Here down at the heel, right? You want it at the heel. This is not so good. It's easy to slip. This is actually gonna keep you going nice and straight. And then the other thing we're gonna do, we're gonna take a look at here is the claw because I want you to keep all your fingers it's important. We don't want any extra trips to the hospital for anything, you know. So what we're trying to do here, we're going to bend this finger under these. These are going to curl a little bit. And this is going to be perpendicular, right, to your cutting board. So this is your wall right here. And you never bring your knife up above your knuckles, just right here. This is your wall. And you can be right next to each other like knife right against skin, in the same way that if you ever work with horses, when you walk around the back, you wanna stay right up close to the, the horse's fanny because that way you can't get a good swing, kick, or a swing at your knuckles, right? So we're gonna keep all our fingers, that's our goal. Okay, so when we're chopping, instead of just trying to force our way through, we're gonna swoop through in a rounded motion and we're gonna guide the veggies to the knife rather than the knife to the fingers, I mean veggies. So let me go over here for a sec, put this aside. So I wanna demonstrate on this particular shallot. Down here, 
So let me see if I can get. So I want to make, I hate to say think of the Nike swoosh, but think of that swoosh shape, right? We're going to rock a little bit like this, and we're really going to keep our, our blade on the wood at all times. Okay, and then we're going to go like this with this nice swooshing motion and that little whooshy, 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 whooshy sound. And push the veggies toward the knife. Does that make sense? Right? So then we have our, our shallot, or sorry, shallot scallions. And we're just going to do like this, right? See what I mean by this rounded motion? This kind of, right? It's a little bit of a scoop. And then also what we're doing, particularly for harder, denser vegetables, instead of trying to force our way into these dense cells, we're actually kind of sliding through these hard cell walls, right? So I can go through actually a lot in a short time if I do this. Excuse you, over here. And again, pushing. I think Mary Pickford heading toward the buzzsaw to sign the movie, right? All right, so then we have a bunch of shallots. Okay. So the other thing that we can do, if we were going to imagine that these were in fact chives and not the the scallions I want to use. So let's say I have something roughly chopped. And what I want to do now is mince. The other motion that we should be getting good at, and again, keeping our fingers, is the hinge. So we can go really fast to a bunch of herbs. It's much more finely chopped in a quick hurry and you're done right so that's all nice and easy I want to show you a quick trick totally an aside off topic here okay normally when you do a, a bell pepper you're gonna try and do this silly thing around here and there's a million ways you could slip and make a mess Turn it upside down. Take off the stem if it's if it's in your way. Boom. Boom. Oh, I got a shot in my knife here. Boom. Right? Easy peasy. Yeah, we don't have to play with this. We don't have to worry about the seeds. We're all done. I love a shortcut. What can I say? I just love a shortcut. Alrighty, so let's go ahead and make our salad here. We are going to be working with a few nice ingredients here that I like a bunch. We're going to work with some nori, which is a seaweed that's typically used in a whole lot of um, Japanese food in your sushi. And I'm just going to fold this like this. I'm going to fold this in three for nice little slices. And I'm going to take a pair of scissors because this works out so much easier. Not your nail scissors or anything like that. Just a nice pair of kitchen, kitchen scissors. And here we go. And so I've got a nice little, about this size, right? Not so bad. And I'm just going to cut through. Just like this, make these cute little shreddies. Quick and easy. Sometimes you can buy this already pre-shredded. But I haven't seen it lately when I was looking for it, so. Okay, so I can't cut a straight line. Don't laugh. Okay. 
think we have a good amount here. There are a whole bunch of um, really great nutrients in seaweed, including iodine and a whole bunch more. And definitely it's great to have in your diet. So we've got this. Our starting point is actually these lovely glass noodles. You can see they look very like little rivulets of cold water, right? So that's gonna be our basis for our salad here. And if you haven't seen them in a store, they look something like this. Oh, what an annoying thing. Um, they're called cellophane noodles or glass noodles or, or harusame. They are made of mung beans. So even if somebody's, you know, not doing gluten or buckwheat even, these are still okay. So we're gonna put, our first layer is gonna be this nice dark layer of seaweed on top, right? And then we're gonna throw in beautiful scallions. That lovely green. I'm gonna put in a whole bunch of nice sweet corn. Ah, oh, summer, yum. All right. And then we're gonna work on, with our nice noodles that we have now, we are gonna work a little bit on julienning some vegetables. Okay, let's get everything out of the way now. Okay, don't need this. All right, so when we say julienne, a uh, fancy word for doing matchstick type stuff. One of the smart things to do to keep, again, keep your fingers, keep from injury, is to flatten the edges. So you go down like this. Mm -hmm. So that's nice and square. And notice I have a little garbage bowl. Make, just let yourself have a little garbage bowl. You don't have to take 20 trips over to the trash can. Keep your little garbage bowl there, it's very handy. If you have chickens, it goes out to the chickens afterward. If you have a compost, it goes out of the compost. All right, so then we're just gonna make nice straight cuts. And then turn, I'm blocking, I think. I'm gonna turn and cut again. And the nice thing is, they're all pretty nice and even here, right? So we're gonna decorate a little like that. Put these over here and cut some more. I am personally not somebody who's like, makes beautiful arrangements. How for my meals, I'm not that person who's like winning Pinterest. Um, partly because a lot of time it's just, you know, it's just me eating what I like. So, but if you're coming down to party time holidays, you know, you want to zhuzh it up a little, I think. And there we go, we're going to have a little... Now you can make them finer than this, it's totally up to you. Depends how sharp your knife is actually. All right, so we got this here. And now we're gonna do the same thing with our Japanese cucumber here. We're gonna make ourselves little squares. How are you doing with yours? Everybody okay? Right now I can't see the screen where, where you guys can chat with me, but I'll be back there in a minute. Okay, so then we're just gonna cut these in nice little slices and then turn and cut again. Okay, 
right, so we've julienne everything. So nice little bite-sized pieces here. We can just decorate. So it looks something like Mount Fuji. You can add on here, um, if you like, you can add on hard boiled eggs, you can add on tomatoes if you like, you can add on bits of tofu, whatever makes you happy enough to do this more than once. Right, because like I say, if you don't love it, you won't do it. Simple as that. There, you know, we're not, we're not trying to make this whole like eating vegetable things painful. We want it to be joyful and delicious, right? Okay, so there is our, our gorgeous salad, right? Here we are. And now we're just gonna make up our little uh, recipe for it, for the sauce. Let me just get the right numbers here. So we have rice vinegar. I'm gonna do three tablespoons of rice vinegar. And three tablespoons of tamari. I like to get the low sodium, preferably organic tamari, because if we have any worries about uh, GMO soy or excessive salt or um, just you know, too much phytoestrogen action coming from our uh, from our soybeans. This is fermented, and so it has a little bit of a different uh, interaction with us. So we've got one, two, three, and then two of lovely sesame oil. I love how much this is fragrant and toasty smelling. And I should say toasted sesame oil gives you that darker, richer flavor. Now you can put in here pepper, you can put in a bit of um, honey if you like it a little sweeter. Whatever suits you. Just gonna give this a nice little shake. All right, so everything's all together. And then we're gonna just dress it nicely. Just enough. And then we're gonna top it with our sesame seeds. And it just has a more goodness. I need to look up the the health reasons for eating sesame seeds, but I've just been so happy with how they taste. I kind of forgot to, but they're fabulous. So there we are. A summer salad that is not your same old, same old, right? This isn't your basic lettuce and, you know, iceberg lettuce and cherry tomatoes. This is like going to a Japanese restaurant, but how easy was that? Look how many colors. We've got the dark green of the seaweed, we've got the orange, we've got all kinds of goodies in here. We've got the allium family represented and then the beans are in the noodles. How about that? Pretty easy and so delicious and so refreshing. I hope you enjoy that because it's just got so much goodness but it's so, so simple. So one last thought before we um, before we leave this topic altogether, I want to get back to uh, one last consideration for feeling comfortable and at ease when you're prepping your basic stuff here is safety first. Folks have asked some questions here and there about uh, is it safe to eat vegetables during the pandemic? So far, there have been zero reports of anything being passed via vegetables. 
As always, you just want to clean them, right? But let's talk about safety in general. Sharp knives are safer than dull knives because we don't force them. It's when you force it and you slip, the blood flows. It's just a mess. Don't do it. Sharpen your knives. Take your time. Clear your space. Not like I do here. Flat sides down as we did with, uh, um, with the carrots and the cucumber because it helps keep things from slipping. Um, use a real wood cutting board like this one. Partly because it's better for holding on to your... Uh, to the things that you're cutting, but also because the tannins in wood actually help fight germs. They have some antibacterial thing going on, which is just lovely. Um, the CDC recommends, see I'm checking in with the experts, um, that when you're at the store or the market, choose products that are neither bruised nor damaged because that's how oxidation starts and that's how bacteria are fed. Pre-cut fruits and vegetables, uh, make sure they've been kept really, really cold. And then if you can keep them cold in your car as well, that's awesome. You wanna keep your fruit and vegetables very separate from raw meat, poultry, seafood, all that stuff, both in your shopping cart and in your bags. Once you get stuff home, you wanna wash your hands, of course. Wash your, oh, you know, give your kitchen utensils just one one last sudsing before you start using them. It's not a bad idea. Likewise, your food preparation surfaces, uh, including your topping boards, in spite of the tannins, still a good idea. Wash your fruit and vegetables under cold running water. Even if you don't plan to eat the peel, uh, you don't need to use soap, detergent, please don't use bleach. Uh, that's a bad idea. But, um, the reason you wash it, even if you're going to peel it, is because when you cut into it, something on the surface can be uh, taken into the inside of your fruit with your knife, if that makes sense, if you can visualize that. Um, the reason you use cold running water is because the things that germs or dust or pesticides or whatever is in the air may stick to is that, that oiliness that's on the surface. It's just a little bit. Um, it's not like the wax on cucumbers. But plants have their own little oiliness, right? And so that's what things are sticking to. So the cold water will loosen that up better than warm water and just things will just wash away. Um, if you want to, you can use a little bit of uh, white vinegar in a big bowl of cold water. That can help loosen up the thing that's sticking to oiliness as well. Um, cut away your damaged or bruised areas, of course, uh, and then dry your fruit or vegetable uh, with a clean paper towel. And then storage-wise, keep fruits and vegetables separate from raw foods that come from animals. Refrigerate within two hours after you cut, peel, or cooked. Uh, things should uh, be chilled at 40 degrees or colder in a nice clean container. And if you need more information, you can check out www.cdc.gov slash food safety slash communication slash steps hyphen healthy hyphen fruits hyphen veggies dot html. So in summary, we're gonna to try to put more plant foods in our diet. Why? Because it helps us specifically resist disease. Many of the phytonutrients um, go to specific purposes, but in general, a good um, selection of plant nutrients will help boost our immune system and fight pathogens and replace unhealthy stuff. For vibrant health, among the other things of the nutrients that will support vibrant health, we also wanna make sure that we're hydrating and keeping our filters clean. We wanna cook like grandma and get some of that comfort food that's just simple and fresh and appealing, um, but also local and seasonal, because when it's real, it really gets to us, right? It really gets to all our, our sensory happy places. Enjoy color and flavor, 
We need the motivation to get to do the right thing. We want to de-stress and share. We want our senses to be fulfilled. You know, we, we want to get all the, the happiness that really Mother Nature intended. You know, she put flavor in there and she put taste buds in our mouths to make us happy doing the right thing. So I definitely want to um, play along, right? Because it seems to be in my own best interest. So um, in general, one last thought about a healthier, um, healthier, more plant-centric diet is that eating a more plant-based, local, seasonal, pesticide and chemical fertilizer-free diet is also really important for the environment and for reversing climate change and that very directly affects all our health, no matter what other things are on our plate, right? Our environment is either going to help us be well or add to, uh, add to sickness and unhappiness. So uh, just another bonus of eating a whole bunch more plants in our diet. So um, one last thing I, I wanted to just stick in here, I, I've been asked uh, on occasion is uh, what's the best way to cook things in order to uh, get the most nutrients. And in fact, that varies a little bit. Um, for example, tomatoes with a little uh, heat make their lycopene more, uh, more available, more bioavailable, right? Our, our body can use it better. Um, but on the other, you know, spectrum, on the other end of the spectrum, beets have this lovely stuff called betaline, and that is, um, it's a real huge antioxidant. It's really, really good for us. But the longer we cook the beets, the less of that good stuff we have. So as much as we'd really like to roast those beets to bring out that sugary goodness that they have, what um, we'll be losing value as we do that, right? So the trick is you can still roast them, just cut them in much smaller pieces, right? So they'll cook quicker. After 15 minutes, your beets start losing, you know, goodness. So um, we can always steam things. We don't lose as much as boiling, but we can definitely steam things. A saute, a light saute is a very good option because it's not as high heat as you know other kinds of cooking. Um, braising is also good if you have a nice baking pan and just a little bit of sauce in there and a lid. You know, things cook all the, all the juices and all the flavors in together and that's always very lovely. Um, so, there's, so there's that. Um, the, um, the other question that I get asked frequently is, is organic really worth it? Is that a real thing? Is it actually just a marketing ploy and things like that? Okay, as a farmer, I can tell you that if I want to get certified for um, as an organic farm, it will take me three years of documenting everything that goes into my farm. All the plant food, all the, um, all the whatever pests, treatment that I use, all the seeds, all the compost, everything, everything has to be documented. If my, um, if my plot was close to the road, it has to be a certain distance away from the road or it's not okay. And the inspector will come out and tell me it's not okay. If we use any kind of plastic mulch, it all has to be picked up at the end of the season. And you do that for three years before you even apply. So um, there is something called the final rule. If you look up the USDA organic final rule, you will see a summary of exactly what farmers have to do to be called organic. And then uh, I think it's kind of convincing because when you look at that list, it's like, why isn't everybody doing this? Why isn't everybody held to this standard? It really would make much more sense. Um, so that's the... Uh, yeah, that's the how and why. Let me just ask you, do you have any questions? Is there anything I can help you with in terms of, you know, how and why we can get more healthy plant food 
and, and plant medicine value into us. Anything? Anything? Have you tried your salad yet? Are you not there yet? Doesn't matter. You'll get to it. I'm going to get to it. I'm going to eat that very shortly for dinner, I'll tell you. So I just want to thank everybody for being with us. Um, don't forget to always enjoy stupid, easy, madly tasty, secretly healthy recipes that you can find on our website. Um, oh, what veggies are fresh in winter? Absolutely. All of the brassica family. So that's your Brussels sprouts, your, um, your Brussels sprouts are there, your um, broccoli, your mustards, all of your Asian greens, um, your bok choy will be there. Um, some of your root vegetables, some of them will be held over from late fall. You also have all your winter squashes that actually grow all summer long, but you pick them in late fall and you, you know, they'll hang on through the winter for the most part. Perfectly intact. Again, the, the skin or the rind of a, of a fruit is just like packaging. You know, it's going to keep everything, um, it's going to keep everything fresh and it's going to keep it from oxidating. Let's see, what else is great in the winter? I don't know. I'm, most, I'm mostly growing greens myself. What else? Um, I'll say the broccoli is pretty great. What else did I grow last winter? Maybe carrot. You can still grow some carrots in a hoop house. Um, trying to think what else is good. What else is good? I mean, all of your root vegetables are still good, right? Because they harden up for winter. They're, they're storing, uh, they're storing energy in the form of carbohydrates in your, in your yams. Um, Let's see what else is good. A lot of herbs are still good in the winter if you grow them in a hoop house or someplace protected. So, oh, can we put the recipe up again? Yeah, absolutely, we can do that. We can do that, not because I do that, because Rebecca is awesome. <laughs> you got a screen capture, that'll work. Very, very easy. And I want to say, too, that um, I didn't go anywhere fancy for the ingredients. This is a basic grocery store for all of these ingredients. No Whole Foods, no Asian markets, nothing special. And this is so delicious. It will be nice and chill. It's going to be fabulous, be totally fabulous. I hope, you, I hope you just nosh on this and just... Feel all the refreshing, refreshing, lovely summer flavors. And, um, and like I say, no carbs in the noodles. It's beans. Well, not no carbs, but no, no grains, I should say. So um, I want to re remind everybody, please sign up for our newsletter. You can go to producewithapurpose.net, and the sign up is right there. And... Since we're doing this every other week, in the interim week, I'll send you a few articles, some notes from the farm, um, and the invitation to our next program. Um, and of course, you can always contact us through, through Facebook or through the website. You can always find us there. Don't forget to check out our resource pantry as well at Produce with a Purpose thinkific.com. I don't know if we have that banner, but you can jump there from our website. It's very, very uh, right on the first page. So you'll definitely find that. So stick with us. And as always, um, this program is free. We do not charge any kind of subscription or sign up here. However, if you'd like to donate or know somebody who would like to donate or sponsor us, we would so appreciate it. Anyway, we hope to see you on the next one. I wish you super fabulous health and delicious eating. And um, yeah, join us next time and stay well and stay safe and take very good care of yourselves. <laughs>